All right, we have something incredibly special for you right now. We all think and even worry about the future, but in this session, we're going to be speaking with two government ministers who have the job of getting us there. We call this session Partners in Disruption and Innovation. Now, disruption, you can come right on up if you like. Disruption does not need, seem to need very much help. You can sit just there. Um, there you go, and just that one, and I'll sit here. Uh, the trick is to work together to invent and execute the innovations that will get us successfully to the other side. So, delighted to have two men with us doing the hard work. Uh, we have the Minister of State for AI, Digital Economy, and Remote Work Applications here, host from the UAE. Thank you so much for being with us, His Excellency Omar Sultan Al Lama. Delighted also to have with us India's Minister for Digital Economy and Entre Entrepreneurship, Honorable Rajiv Chandrasekhar. Thanks very much. Fantastic. Oh, we can do better than that. Come on, huge round of applause for both of them. Right. That's what we like. So let's get us started. Um, Your Excellency, you have said before that you see uh, India's digital fi fingerprints all around you. Tell us what you mean. I, I think I'll be known for this quote <laughs> for the rest of my life. Uh, actually, just to make a correction, I don't, did not say digital. I said fingerprint. Okay. And the reason for that is because um, if you look at any company, any tech company, any solution that people use today, and if you dig deep, you'll find an Indian there doing some of the hard work. And that is just testament to how robust, how incredible the talent is, regardless of where they are. So if you look at Europe, you'll find Indian talent building the tech ecosystem in Europe. If you look at the Middle East, if you look at the US, if you look at Latin America, if you look at Asia. And in my humble opinion, uh, I think that what we're seeing right now in terms of the Indian tech scene booming, digital scene booming is just the beginning. Mm. So we've seen Indian talent around the world build the digital landscape. I think at, that, at this point of time, they're going to go back to India and make India the capital of technology uh, mm. globally. I can see you nodding. I know you're with, uh, with, right. <laughs> with His Excellency. Uh, you know, I'm from California, which for many years, we set the rules on automobile emissions by being tougher and smarter than other states. And in the West, there are many people who think that Europe has emerged as this role of setting the rules for big technology companies. But in my conversations over the last couple of days, I think that we're missing a trick. Uh, and it feels to me like India could well be setting the stage as the big giant there. What do you think? Um, I won't disagree with you to start with. Uh, I think. Uh, I mean, I look at it a little differently. I don't think we are in a race with, uh, with Europe or uh, any other country for that matter. We see the technology opportunity uh, very differently, I think. Uh, we see the need to protect our consumers' rights to data as one clear obligation that we have. But we don't see that as a binary or uh, at the expense of excluding or, in a sense, slowing down the innovation ecosystem that is... Uh, underway in India and uh, in partnerships with uh, other nations that work with India. So I think we have evolved a framework, uh, and I, I think you're alluding to the digital personal data protection law, and uh, there was this narrative that the European GDPR was the gold standard, mm -hmm. uh, and I have said when a question was posed to me recently about that, I said, look, we respectfully beg to dis uh, disagree. We think we will chart our own course, we are, as you know, 820 million Indians online. We are the largest presence on the global internet. And so uh, we deserve an opportunity to shape our own destiny mm. and lay out the rules and laws uh, that should govern the future of the internet uh, on our own. So I think that is where we come from. We see this opportunity as something very important for our young Indians. And we have framed uh, this framework of rules and laws that will, uh, like I said, uh, address what seemed to be a binary of uh, consumer protection versus innovation. We've managed to do both. Interesting. So I'm going to get some, some big, big questions out here at the, mo at the beginning, but I am going to turn to the audience, so have a think about what you would like to, to be asking them. I wonder, Your Excellency, 
What's the message from the FTX debacle that you take home? Do you think the world needs stronger regulation of a cryptocurrency to protect the potential benefits? And who should those regulators be? And I think it's really interesting because the folks that I've spoken to here about Metaverse, Web3, um, crypto, blockchain, a very different reaction than when I speak to people in, in the US about, about what's happened. So um, first, um, Sam Backman fried was arrested today. Um, so for those of you who, who really care about the issue, I think justice is going to be served soon, um, right after he is able to disclose why he did what he did. Mm. I, I am pro-regulation for a number of reasons. First, if you look at what the UAE did, uh, our virtual asset regulation authority went and issued um, FTX a MVP license. What an MVP license is, it's a license not to allow these companies to operate, but tell them, come and open your books. Show us how you operate. Show us you know, the actual inner workings of your company mm -hmm. in a way that is trusted from both parties. And I can confidently say that they were not able to present that. Mm. Right? So that is why FTX did not get a full license. And many other companies as well did not get a full license. One of the reasons that uh, I think regulation is needed, especially when you talk about a new technology, it, start it starts off as a wild, wild west. It starts off with people who say the right things, but might not necessarily be doing the right things. And if you allow for it to continue to grow without any regulations being introduced, without any opinion from the government, then you see the most amount of pain. Mm. But when the government comes in, gets involved, and says, look, we're willing to work with you, but try to show us what you're doing and how that works out, and also tell us how you're protecting people, then the chances for error are going to be lower. Mm. Think about it this way. In the early 90s, we had the internet um, becoming mainstream. We had a lot of companies come out. We also saw you know, some of the debacles like pept.com being sold for I don't know how many million and it turned out to be not worth that much. Mm. When the dot-com bubble crashed, people thought that the internet was over. And that's it. Do you know what happened in the same time period? The UAE doubled down and announced a full city for the internet, called the Dubai Internet City, mm. and said, it's not Dubai Microsoft City, it's not Dubai Pets.com City, it's the Dubai Internet City. We believe in the underlying technology. Mm -hmm. It's the same with blockchain, it's the same with the talent that is in the crypto space. We believe in the talent for those who are doing something genuine, that are, that are doing something good. We believe that blockchain has great applications and we are going to continuously work towards that. Anyone who's investing in this space, and I say this not to the people in the room, but anyone and everyone that I meet, it is a risky industry. Mm. You, uh, you don't go into a casino looking to make guaranteed returns. Right? You might make returns, but today it is an unproven sector. You should not go into it without being aware of the challenges that might come out there. Again, our job as a government is to try to decipher what's happening, remove ambiguity, and then celebrate those who really do a good job mm. at this point. Interesting. Minister, did you want to come in as well? Yeah, no, I, I don't disagree with the, His Excellency. I, I, I will add to that the following, which is that I do believe that governments uh, uh, around the world have lagged in behind innovators. And for a number of years and indeed uh, decades, there was almost a free pass to those who came onto the internet. And as long as you said you were doing something innovative, uh, regulators backed off and there was almost an argument that you don't get governments involved. I think the, the governments around the world are now catching up to the fact that the internet represents good, uh, internet represents innovation, but the internet also represents user harm, it represents criminality, it represents FTX, it represents, represents uh, all kinds of players. And so therefore there has to be this framework of uh, rules and no-go areas for all platforms. We in India are building that framework, uh, which is not to say that we will strongly regulate. I don't, I don't like the use of the word strong regulation with the internet and innovation. These are, in a sense, uh, opposites and a contradiction. So we will lay out these boundary conditions of openness, safety and trust and accountability, which we believe will allow the innovators and the true innovators to flourish and those who want to you know, hmm. do an FTX not to. 
So well, let's talk about one of the innovations that India is continuing to build. We had a whole session today on looking at India's stack, which is absolutely fascinating and still being built, in fact. Um, really on the cutting edge, India is, of electronic payments. It has been a universe dominated until relatively recently by technology companies from the US and China, but I'd love you to explain, um, Honorable Minister, the significance of what India is building. So I think if you, if you go back to the genesis of the India stack and the problem that it was trying to solve, and the problem was that uh, India as this large democracy had for decades uh, been stuck with this narrative that uh, government payments and government subsidies did not really reach the beneficiaries without corruption, without delay, without leakage. And that was famously captured almost as if it was a fate and destiny by a prime minister in the 80s saying that 100 rupees that left Delhi, only 15 rupees reached the citizens. Right. Uh, he, he, al he almost said that as if it was something that uh, we were fated to endure for the rest of our lives. And then when Prime Minister Narendra Modi came in in 2014, he really said we will deploy technology. We will deploy technology to create identities and do identity authentication and then create a layer on top of that which would be payment. Uh, so it solved a government problem. It solved a problem of trust between government and citizen, uh, but has spawned a tremendously innovative and tremendously fast-growing ecosystem around what has now become the India stack. The India stack uh, today represents an opportunity for the global south, countries that have, in a sense, been left behind or have not been able to afford the digitization that other advanced nations have been able to invest in. It affords them an opportunity, it gives them an opportunity to rapidly climb up that ladder of digitalization mm -hmm. that many other countries have embarked on and successfully achieved. So I think that is what the India stack represents. It represents, for the first time, in a sense, the ability for small countries, large countries, big countries who have, in a sense, been kept away from the technology digitalization opportunity to rapidly uh, climb up that ladder and, and, and deliver to their citizens, deliver to their governments the benefits of technology. Mm. And so we are very excited by it, and uh, me and the Excellency here have been talking about how we can take the India stack, cooperate, and making sure that's available to more and more countries around the world. Interesting. So, um, Excellency, why don't you talk us through what, what you're thinking? How, how could the UA use, UAE use the India stack? So. I just want to add on to what His Excellency said. What the India stack uh, provides is honestly a no excuse, um, unfortunately, mandate for countries that say it can't be done, uh, whether you are small or big. A country the size of India was able to implement something that is that cutting edge within less than a decade. It is, I cannot state how incredible that mm. is. And it was not imported. The reality of this, what makes it even 10 times more impressive for me as an individual, and I think for a lot of people, is the fact that it was not an imported solution. It's easy for you to plug and play something that's imported. Right. To build it from scratch and to scale it to a billion people in less than 10 years, mm. you can't do that even if you're a private business in Silicon Valley. So we go back to the first point I made when, when I talked about the Indian fingerprint. It, it just is clear that what we are seeing right now is a snowball that is moving much faster, getting much bigger from India dominating the sphere globally. And the India tech stack is a, is a great example of that. The thing I would like to say is, look at the diversity of the Indian population internally from the different provinces. If you're able to uh, let everyone agree that this is the right solution and use it in a way where they believe that this is going to be a way for them to empower themselves and make their lives better and as well, have a higher trust within government as well and have less friction, you're able to do it across continents. Mm. And that's our belief uh, here, and that's why we're talking with the minister mm. to see what we can do. I don't think that there's a reason why the African continent can't use this stack in, in, uh, within itself as well as within, in certain countries um, amongst themselves. Now, maybe there is going to be some requirement for lobbying. Maybe there is going to be some requirement for explaining what happens and what doesn't happen on this front. Uh, one thing we're doing is we're looking at lessons learned from the India tech stack and seeing how we can move aggressively in the UAE mm -hmm. to have a similar solution. 
Um, I think we are going to take this to other countries that are willing, and the Indian government has been gracious enough to say that we're willing to open it to other countries. So um, th there's a lot to be done. Uh, hopefully, both of us are going to be able to do it. Give me an example of what you're, you have been able to do. I mean, I think about the, I'm a US taxpayer uh, and a voter. I received my check from President Trump, I think months after it had been written, all the way in, in the UK. And I believe that when you sent payments to, to Indian citizens, they arrived within instantly. instantly. Yeah. And it took two weeks to figure out who needed to get what, and then the payments were actually done in 24 hours, right? Right. right. Any other example you'd give me about what's possible with this? No. Look, I, I'll, I'll tell you my personal experience on this, and I, I travel quite a bit around the country. Um, I had the opportunity recently to go to a part of India where no minister has visited since independence. Mm. And uh, so it was, a, it was a remote part of the northeast of India, and I reached there, and the next morning um, there were 500 community members in a, in a room like this, and uh, they obviously were very happy to see a minister uh, and all of that. And I asked them, look, uh, how many of you have this direct benefit transfer, which is the digital, uh, and every one of them put up their hand. Hmm. And how many of you have been receiving this money instantaneously in your bank account? So this remote location of India, which otherwise uh, would not have seen the presence of the government of India or would have seen it in very, very exceptional and rare circumstances, was now dealing with the government of India on a real-time basis every day, uh, you know, on, on regular intervals and getting all of what was due to them, pensions, subsidies. And during the entire COVID pandemic, there were people who were receiving benefits and payments into their account directly and keeping them safe during the pandemic. Mm. So, How did that make you feel? Uh, no, no, look, uh, uh, we've all been evangelists of technology, but this is some real transformation, real impact mm. on people's lives who otherwise would have been helpless, would have, would have been left to fend for themselves. So I think, in my opinion, the real narrative about India Stack, uh, at least from our point of view, is that it is really mainstreamed every Indian who otherwise would have stayed out of the system or would have been at the edges and the periphery of the system and would have had to deal with all of the problems on their own. Uh, now they have been mainstream, they feel empowered, they feel connected, and they feel like they are talking to the government of India at, uh, at moments of trouble and crisis. So I think that is my experience. And uh, after being three decades in technology, I mean, I can tell you this, I mean, I've, I've seen chips being launched and technologies mm -hmm. being launched. But to see the people who've been otherwise left out of governance, being mainstreamed and connected uh, in this kind of a way through the power of technology is extremely satisfying. Mm. Excellency. So I just want to say two things. The only way that you can combat bureaucracy is through digitization. Because there are certain levels of scale mm. that you cannot achieve with conventional thinking of I'll throw people at the problem and I'll throw conventional infrastructure at the problem. But with digital, you can access people with the speed of light, distance becomes uh, irrelevant, mm -hmm. and you're able to get to them 24 hours of the day. So I think the approach that India had was really wise, and I think it was the right approach. One thing that you alluded to, um, uh, to a previous question to His, His Excellency is the fact that uh, is India part of the race? And I think uh, one important lesson learned, and this is how we approach things in the UAE as well, is if you look at physics, if you are in a race, and you start behind someone, you need to be um, X percentage faster than they are to be able to catch up and then mm -hmm. exceed them. If you don't start in the race altogether and go into another race, it's up to them to follow you. I think right. that's what India did. And they did not emulate anyone. Right. They went and they created their own path that today others are emulating. And I think with the UAE as well, when it comes to looking at the India stack, what we want to do internally is take the learnings from India because you know we have these uh, joint meetings at all, uh, all times, and then see how we can carve out our own path mm. that is relevant for a country of our size, that's relevant for a country uh, of our position as well. What are the kinds of things that you're interested in exploring with the stack technology? Well, uh, look at, I think the government applications are proven, mm. right? The ID. Um, internet access, uh, banking, etc. What's really interesting to me personally, because I lead also the digital economy side, 
is how you're able to open up that infrastructure to create companies out of them. Mm. Today, we are blessed in the UAE to have a lot of incredible companies coming out of the UAE, becoming truly global and being successful. But they are doing it because government is not getting involved in their business. How can government provide them the infrastructure necessary to be able to 10x their outcomes, mm. right? Maybe our infrastructure is different to India's infrastructure. If you look at our global infrastructure when it comes to port operations, right? DP World operates 78 ports around the world. 10% mm. of global trade goes through the UAE. Hmm. Right? How are you able to open this up to create the next logistics unicorn globally? With Emirates Airlines and Etihad, how are you able to open up the aviation data to create the next billion dollar or, or decacorn in the aviation industry, services, etc.? Mm -hmm. So I think what we need to do right now is customize this approach that India has, has uh, endeavored on to what our strengths are, and then work with India to ensure that there's a win-win situation win for the UAE and win for India. And that's what the SEPA agreement is all about. Interesting. All right. Well, I want to get to the SEPA agreement. I want to make sure we allow the audience to ask a question. Have we got a question for our honorable ministers? Otherwise, I get to keep asking. Any questions? All right. I, so you mentioned there the SEPA agreement. So you know, one of the goals of having you both on stage here together is to highlight the importance of partnership. And the SEPA, it's a bilateral trade agreement. It's in the background. So tell me, talk me through some of the areas where you think this partnership will, will flourish. No, I, I mean, I, I think there is a tremendous opportunity, and I don't want to really build any uh, sort of uh, boundaries around where we can uh, cooperate and where we shouldn't. But the broader idea through SEPA and these conversations is that we would create these corridors of innovation and trust uh, for technology and innovation of the coming years between entrepreneurs and startups and enterprises in the UAE and the startups and entrepreneurs in, in India. So I think the broader framework in our mind is that we have what we have. We will continue to expand the opportunity and make it more diverse in terms of technology and innovation in, in India, move from the consumer tech to semiconductors and electronics mm -hmm. and AI and blockchain, but also have these really enduring partnerships between UAE and India, India and other countries, which are built around these corridors where data can flow, innovation can flow, ideas and, uh, and products and devices can come out of those partnerships. So uh, I think there's tremendous opportunity in the coming years in terms of what we can do together. And uh, SEPA is just an enabling framework, but I think the minds and the bright minds uh, in India and the UAE will, uh, will, will really, mm. uh, hopefully, uh, shape the future of technology. Do you want to add, add to that, Excellency? I think that was a great answer. I also think that there are um, certain variables of strength that both countries have that can build on each other. And uh, I spoke about this uh, previously. If we think about, first, uh, I have a question to the audience. How far back do you guys think that the UAE-India relationship goes? Yeah. Raise your hand if you think it's 100 years. 200 years? 500 years? So, so not forever. So the, the, the oldest dated artifact that proves that there was joint trade and, and cultural interaction between the UAE and India is in a location here in the UAE called Saruq al-Hadid which proves that there was interactions between both cultures, uh, the Indian culture and, and the people that lived here 4,000 years ago, hmm. so, so four millennia. Um, I think naturally, we've always tended to gravitate towards each other because we are close in culture, the people are friendly to each other, and the advantages, the geographical advantages that mm -hmm. we both have, whether it's India, the sheer size of India, and the UAE, the, the way that it becomes a hub and access to the rest of the world, as well an attractor of people from around the world to come to it, ensures that something like the SEPA agreement is uh, bound to succeed. We will bring, I think, the diversity of talent. We will bring the access of markets. I think India is going to bring the, the sheer ingenuity of the talent, mm. the robustness of the infrastructure that exists there, 
the incredible solutions that India is providing internally that they can take to the rest of the world, as well as us bringing the world, if necessary, to India whenever India needs it. Mm. So there's a lot that can happen on that front. Second question for the audience. All right, we do have a brave soul. We're going to bring you the microphone. Introduce yourself and make sure it's a question rather than a statement. Good evening, uh, gentlemen. This is Krishna Raj. Uh, I run an impact-driven edtech uh, out of India. I uh, happen to be from the same college as uh, His Excellency also. Uh, the question for both the ministers and especially the comment uh, Your Excellency made that uh, we would like to take the India stack and see how UA can become a harnessing a hub for moving into uh, other territories like, like Africa. So uh, I understand this discussion is happening at a G2G level, but how as uh, entrepreneurs and startups we can get engaged so that instead of we walking alone, how we can collaborate with the government and uh, you know, reach our uh, common missions together? Uh, great question. Uh, let's look at historical examples, good historical examples of um, joint progress and improvement. So whether it's you know, US-China uh, is a great example of how much the US was able to do. It was mostly driven by the private sector. The government did very little. So the government agreed with the other government in terms of bilaterals on, and this was in the 80s, right? They agreed on certain principles. And then it was private sector to private sector, people to people, right? Our job is to lay the red carpet and uh, welcome you guys uh, in, whether it's here in the UAE or in India. Our job as well is to have understanding that entrepreneurs are going to be protected uh, in, in both uh, countries. And our job is also to ensure that there is frictionless flow of talent, of business from countries. Now, when it comes to the India tech stack, when you go and you promote yourself, when you come and say, oh, I have a good solution, people tend to take it with either a grain of salt or tend to feel like, okay, this is not for me. But when you have a third party, another country, that actually is friendly to, to that country coming and saying, look, this works, we've seen it, and if you'd like, we can actually open the doors, it becomes a lot more uh, smooth for the countries to work together. The next step is after these solutions are embraced by countries, is to see how we can ensure that there is flow of business from India to the countries that uh, embraced India Tech Stack, as well as flow of business from the, country, the, the countries that embrace it towards India, whether it's entrepreneurs. And then as well, integration of financial systems, integration of IDs you know, between both countries to ensure that people are able to either get residencies and things like that. I don't think it's going to be a one size fits all. It, it will always be a negotiation between both countries to see what each one feels comfortable, but we will facilitate for sure as the UAE. Interesting. To add? Yeah, um, I won't add too much to that, uh, excepting to say that uh, the private sector and entrepreneurs are obviously central to proliferating the India stack and and or customizing it to the the demands of the customer country, uh, as the case may be. But we, what we intend to do, and we have been having this discussion with His Excellency, that we will have uh, a session, uh, a kind of a workshop that we will host in India where we will invite all potential SIs and other uh, application layer uh, developers and introduce them to our pitch on the India stack so that you are much more part of that effort of evangelizing the India stack and it's not just uh, governments doing it. So we will certainly reach out to all of those who are interested and uh, in a sense create an ecosystem of uh, private entrepreneurs and startups who can support those countries who seek to adopt the stack. Excellent. Any other question? Yeah, there's one back there. Keep your hand up. Yeah. My name is Lakshmanan. This question is to Honorable Minister from India, Rajiv Chandrasekhar. With India assuming its uh, presidency of G20, how is India looking at leveraging the India stack to the G20? And I know. India has invited UAE part of the G20, and UAE has very successfully done the Coders Initiative, which has developed that. How is India looking at combining forces with UAE and taking this across to the world? Thank you. I think the previous answer and the previous responses were in part answers to your question. I think we are going to work together, which is the point that both of us have mentioned. Uh, the Prime Minister of India, Narendra Modi ji, has already said publicly that India stack 
is something that India will offer uh, and work with other partners to ensure that that offering is available to the global south, countries of the global south and those who don't have their own uh, technology uh, and they want uh, to progress in this path of digitalization. So that is our avowed goal, our stated intention. We will work with partners uh, as uh, we, have, we have discussed. And uh, we will, of course, involve the private sector and entrepreneurs and startups to make that uh, happen. Uh, that is the long and short of uh, what I can say at this point. But uh, as this unfolds, and as uh, in these various engagements, more and more countries show an interest in engaging with the India stack, uh, we will progressively modulate our strategy and, and uh, evolve the partnerships for that. Interesting. I've got a question. Um, you know, a big priority for India is to enhance its, its place globally in semiconductor electronics manufacturing. How can the partnership between India and the UAE help this objective? Uh, look, I, I, I actually think that, uh, there, like I said earlier, I don't think there are any limits to this partnership. Mm -hmm. And uh, to simply assume that this is about the internet only, or this is only about consumer tech, or it's only about the India stack, is a misreading of the real potential that exists between India and UAE, and really the design that has been put into place to, around this corridor of innovation and technology that we are trying to build. I think semiconductor design, microelectronics, innovation around AI, innovation around blockchain, high-performance computing, all of these areas are uh, of deep interest to us, and I suspect deep interest uh, to the startups and entrepreneurial ecosystem in the UAE. And I am here, and we are working very closely together with His Excellency to see if these can be core development models, because the time of the past where there were some countries who sort of built technologies and then sort of hung on to them and grabbed on, hung on to them, is in my opinion a dated model. Mm. The model of the future is where partners co-develop technologies for the future, entrepreneurs under the enabling framework of governments that trust each other uh, develop these uh, innovations for the future. And that, in my opinion, by saying that, I say that it uh, automatically does not limit us to only A or B. Mm. And I, I have had already conversations with His Excellency about semiconductors and electronics. Uh, and we will explore that as we go forward. OK, interesting. So our time is up. But um, last word to Your Excellency. Thanks very much for hosting us here uh, in the UAE. What's your message to the, the folks um, who are here, founders, funders? Uh, we've got entrepreneurs and investors. What's your message? Uh, in terms of partnership uh, and the next year? So, uh, the next year, that's a loaded question. <laughs> um, 20 days. Yeah. Well, next 365 days. Uh, okay, so, so my, my hunch is this. We hear the rhetoric globally about looming recession, about startups getting affected, about you know, many different things being said, whether it's on the crypto space with FTX and other fronts as well. I think it's time that we don't start seeing ourselves in the lens of other, other geographies. Mm. We are just getting started. And I think that today this is our time. This is our time as a region. This is our time as countries. This is our time as investors, as entrepreneurs, as solution providers. And it is still greenfield because there's a lot that needs to happen that has not happened yet. So my, my ask for all of you is don't let the noise affect your planning. Yes, we might see some turbulence, but the turbulence should just make us more excited about how fast we can go and, and how, how far we can go. Another thing is, I think what is heartwarming and what really makes me optimistic is in a global rhetoric where people are talking, are talking about polarization, isolationism, the end of globalization, we have countries like the United Arab Emirates and India that are talking about more collaboration, more cooperation, more co-creation, co and talking about a future that is a future of many rather than the future of few. So I'm very optimistic. I think that pessimism has never motivated people. Mm. It's always been optimism. And I think that it's our leaders today, the leaders of India and the UAE, that are rallying people to create a better future, and it's on us to do it.
Thank you. Fantastic final words. Well, thank you very much, uh, both of you gentlemen. Let's give them a round of applause thank for you. the Media Global Forum. Mark, what a day. Yeah, what a good day. What a good day. What's your takeaway? Every, I mean, d d despite the economic geopolitical backdrop, mm. the optimism was infectious, cautious optimism, whether mm. talking about India, opportunities for both founders and funders. Mm. I was quite surprised. I think in our bubble in London, yeah. because London is a bit gloomy, both on a weather front and <laughs> on, a ge on a political front and on an economic front. We yeah. had GDP data today, which showed a contraction. Mm. You, you can be in that gloomy mindset. Clearly, there is a difficult backdrop. We just had US inflation, by the way, which came in slightly lower than expected. Year on year, it was sev just above 7%, but we're mm. still at 7% inflation. But yeah. despite that, the funders and the founders were, were, were animated, were mm. confident, said that this is an opportunity, quality, partnerships, collaboration. I, I was... I was cheered. Yeah, no, it was me wonderful. too. It really, it gives you a, a real lift, doesn't it? It does. I, I would like to no note there that you can take the man out of Bloomberg, but you can't take no, Bloomberg out of the man. You can't. Still following those inflation. I know the day. I'm so sad, aren't I? Following inflation. <laughs> I mean, who else follows US CPI? I'm a true nerd. Yeah. But I do want to say that that, that point about, uh, about optimism, I think I got in my session mm. with, with in, in, in both the investors and the founders as well. Actually, this is a moment you can dig deep, you can motivate your team, you yes. get less attrition, you, get, uh, you can get more team buy-in. It's a time to, to, build, to build something great. Yes, build. Build. So what have you got up tomorrow? Tomorrow's big day. Big day, big, big IGF day. studio back here in the forum. The studio's behind here, we're in here, we've got like four panels, and then a panels. whole load of one hour yeah. Shows. sessions, shows behind there, so you can flitter between the two of them. Exactly, oh, yeah. exactly. Looking forward to it. Leadership, future of women, we've got yeah. climate, we've got future finance. Well, it's been a delight for me to be here with you today. Yeah, Thank ditto. you, Mark. Look forward to tomorrow. See you nice and early. We kick off at 10? Kick off at 10. Yeah. <laughs> Have a good day, everyone. See you then. Have a good well night. Well done. <laughs> See you all tomorrow. Good. All right, good. Nice.